This is quite a way to start a new year. Amen? <laughs> no place I'd rather be. And this is Mark Rauschkob. And Mark and Tiffany have been studying together for, oh, two or three years. And they've watched all of my DVDs and all of Doug Batchelor's online series. And, and when I was, when I was uh, talking to them about what we believe and what the Adventist Church believes that the Bible is saying, he could say everything before I had a chance to. And uh, I heard a lot of the same stuff that I was saying coming out of his mouth, so I expect you to be preaching Revelation now pretty soon, Mark. <laughs> Go ahead. Mark, because Jesus loves you, and because he came into this world to save you, and you have chosen to follow him, to follow the Lamb, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take a step. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Let me just pray. Oh, Lord, we just thank you so much for Jesus, especially in the life that he gave to us. And for Mark and Tiffany, both wanting to follow you. And so, Lord, we lift them up to you. And we know that right now, as we stand in this water, you're filling him with gifts of your Holy Spirit to be used in reaching out to build up the kingdom of God. And Lord, I just pray that you use them both in a mighty way. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. This is Ray. And Dee, I don't see Dee out there. Oh, there she is. She called me up one day and said, do you know this guy, Ray, that's been going to your Sabbath school class? And I said, yeah, I know who he is now. And uh, she said, well, he knows everything that he needs to know to be a part of the church, but he's not a member. And so I said, I'll talk to him. And next Sabbath, I had a little chat with him. And... Uh, found out that D was correct. <laughs> he had been studying, he's watched my DVDs, Doug Bachelor series, who else? Dave Asherick, but everybody out there. And he knew all the answers to all the questions. And I asked him, I said, what's holding you back? And he said, well, one little thing. He says, I'm smoking. And I said, well, we're not gonna let that stand in the way, are we? And so I gave him, uh, little tips to kick the habit. And how long has it been? Uh, a, little over two weeks. a little over two weeks now. And God has given him the victory. <laughs> and so I can't wait to see what else God has in store for you, Ray. Ray, because Jesus loves you, and he came into this world as an innocent lamb, died on the cross to save you. And you've chosen to follow the lamb and to be a part of his last day church. And so, Ray, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Lord, I just thank you so much. First for Jesus and the life that you've given us in him. And for Ray's decision to follow you into the waters of baptism 
to become a new creation, a new person, empowered by your Holy Spirit right now with gifts to enable him to be able to share the good news of Jesus with others. And Lord, we place him in your hands to be used in your as your will directs. And we ask you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, Ray. Thank you. Midnight brings a new year. The old is gone. The new has come. You can't bring back the old. It's done. At midnight, you and I would have traveled 575 million miles since this time last year. You weren't aware of it, but that's how far the earth has traveled. We're on the earth, so we went with it. Millions of miles without even breaking a sweat. At midnight tonight, we embark on a new journey. It instills a kind of sense of pride Stepping into the new year, fresh, pure, clean, sinless. Thought about that? Not one sin has been committed in 2023. Now, don't worry about the West East Coast. I'm talking about us. I know about that. We haven't sinned in the new year. And it's waiting for us with outstretched arms. Kind of reminds me of Napoleon when he said, the world is ours to conquer. The new year is ours to conquer. But no doubt that kind of feeling inspired the concept of the new year's resolution. And it's interesting, Ben Franklin said, a new year is a bold and arduous project to moral perfection. A perfection that always results in inevitable failure. And I think we can kind of say amen. Paul described it in Romans 7.15, What I want to do, I don't do, and that which I do is what I don't want to do. That's what I do is what I hate. And I think we can identify with that. But our text says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Everyone in Christ is a new creation. Are you in Christ? then you are a new creation. So why do we still struggle with sin? That's a good question. And it gets even more confusing in 2 Corinthians 5, just two verses before that, verse 15. He died for all, so those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and raised again. So Jesus died for all. Therefore, we who live, no, we don't live for ourselves anymore. We live for Him. Both His death and His resurrection change everything. And they radically affect our relationship with other people. Watch this. Since He died, that's what he's talking about. Since he died and since he rose for us, we no longer live for ourselves. We live for him. Since all of that, verse 16, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Just as we no longer regard Christ simply from a worldly point of view, well, what is a worldly point of view? We 
shouldn't, if we're in Christ, we should not regard anyone from a worldly point of view. Do you do that? Well, you ask, what's a worldly point of view? The world judges things outwardly. Outward appearance. Outward impressions. The first Samuel 16, 7 says the Lord does not look at things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. Don't look at people. Don't regard people from a worldly point of view, from outward appearances. That's what that's what Saul of Tarsus did. And that's why he misjudged Jesus. He was looking at him from an outly point of view. He thought the Messiah would be a big, powerful general, a ruler that would crush the yoke of Roman. And this guy, he didn't do anything except going around patting people on the head and telling them how much he loved them and forgive sins. That's all they saw. And then when he hung dying on the cross, the curse of death, how could he be the Messiah? Look at him. They judged him from the outward appearance, not from the heart. And therefore, we in him can no longer judge each other by outward appearances. We have to judge by the heart. But we can't read the heart. Only God knows the heart. That's why... God is the judge. We don't judge each other. We form opinions. We form likes. We form preferences. But we are not to say whether a brother or a sister is in Christ a new creation or not. Because things don't always appear to us the same way they appear to God. And for us to say that this brother or this sister is not in Christ, can't be in Christ, is putting ourselves in God's place and doing what only God can do. It doesn't mean that we don't strive to make our appearance and our behavior more and more Christ-like. Paul had a lot to say about that. But here he's talking about how we regard each other. God reconciled the world to himself. And we are not the ones that can judge is this brother or this sister a new creation or not. Only God can judge that. Paul only used that phrase, new creation, one time, other than the one we just read. And that one is found in Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Well, that just tells us what a new creation is not. <laughs> it's not circumcision. It's not uncircumcision. You see, the Jews thought that a person became saved, or a Jew, which would be equal to saved, only by circumcision. And if you are circumcised, you're saved. That's a short abbreviation for works. And Paul said, no. Circumcision doesn't mean anything. The only thing that means something is the new creation. So new creation is not depending on your works for God to accept you. But what is the new creation. I think Paul explains that in Galatians 5, verse 6. And this is powerful. He says, 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. That's what means everything. The new creation is faith working through love. Well, how do we get that kind of faith that makes us a new creation? You've heard the verse in Romans 10, verse 17. Paul said, faith comes through hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So how do we get faith? By hearing the message. The message is the word that comes through Christ. So if we dig into God's word, not just to learn doctrine, not just to be able to recite sermons, but dig into God's word to find the deeper meaning of that faith that works through love and to learn to crave that kind of love in our hearts. We can't generate faith. It's a gift of God. We simply ask God, God, forgive me. I repent for my sins. Give me eternal life. I want to accept your reconciliation. And with my weak and frail faith, Jesus, I trust you. Kind of reminds me of the prayer of the father whose son was demon-possessed, brought him to Jesus. And Jesus said, do you believe? And, Mark, and he said in Mark 9, 24, I do believe. Help me to overcome my unbelief. You have to admire that kind of honesty, don't you? Humility. He was effectively saying, I know my faith is weak. I know my faith is partial. It's incomplete. But still, I trust you, Jesus, and I only trust you. And that's the kind of faith that makes us a new creation. And that's why we can't judge who has that faith or not, because God is the one who gives it. And then when we receive faith, he gives us another gift. And this one we find in Romans 5, verse 5. Hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts. How does He do that? By the Holy Spirit. God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given to us. So, He gives us faith. He requires faith. He gives us faith. It may be shaky. It may be weak. But we pray, God, help my unbelief. And He gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who pours out God's love into our heart. It's not even our love. It's God's love that He puts in us. That means that we can participate in salvation. Not that we do anything to save ourselves. No, it's all the work of God. But when He puts His love into our hearts, it doesn't just sit there. It begins to manifest itself by the power of the Spirit through us in our lives as we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. It's a faith that's different from mere doctrinal faith. Maybe you can recite the Ten Commandments. Maybe you can recite the three angels' messages. Maybe you know the whole book of Revelation. I almost had it learned at one point. It's starting to go away a little bit now. I have to keep reminding myself. It's a faith that isn't so concerned with following the letter of the law. It's the kind of faith that isn't so concerned with, I keep the Sabbath because God said it's holy. That's true, it is. And we should keep it because God said it's holy. But it, this kind of faith, the faith of God with God's love in our heart, changes that. It's different. 
I keep the Sabbath because God loves me so much that He set aside a certain time to spend with me that He can't do any other time. And I want to be there for God. Sure, we check off seventh day Saturday. But folks, you can sit in this pew every Sabbath 52 times a year and still not keep the Sabbath if it isn't out of that love for God that has to be cherished through daily digging into the Word and hearing the Word so that our faith grows day after day. True faith assumes a right relationship with God. A a relationship that expresses His love to Him and to the world. In fact, John 3.16, you know the verse. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. He, God sent Jesus. Why? Because He loves us. He sent Jesus because He loves us so much. He wants to be with us. He wants to put His love in our heart. Not our love. Thank God for that. He sent Jesus because he loved the world, even his enemies. Do you? Do you love even your enemies? It seems so unlovable to you at some times. That's what God did. Therefore, back to verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has come. The new has come. To be in Christ means to be with Jesus. I'm with you, Lord. I want your love in my heart. I want you to live out your love through me to be in Christ. And God pours his love into our hearts. And with that love, we become a new creation. (laughs) With those two words, God kind of summarizes the gospel. A new create. We view things differently from the world. The world judges outwardly. We try with God to look at a man's heart and understand that we'll never really penetrate and fully understand it and accept him. Reconciled to God, therefore he's reconciled to us. And like 2023, which is right now a perfect new year until 12.01, and then it won't be perfect anymore. But we reach out into the perfect future and bring it in to our imperfect life and begin a new journey in Christ. We become a new creature a new creation in Him. And Paul goes on to say, taking up that theme, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old is gone, the new has come. Now in verse 18, he goes on to say, all of this, and this is what I want you to really grasp this morning. We've been hinting all around it, but here it is, right here. All of this, referring to Christ and His new creation, All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. What does it mean? He reconciled us to him. The word reconcile is a return to a former favor with God. And if we're going to return to being in favor with God, then at some point man had to have had a valid relationship with God. But it was. It was broken by sin. And it's been attacked and crumbled for thousands of years. But now the Bible says... Even in Romans 8, 7, the sinful mind is hostile to God, separated from God. 
So how does he reconcile himself? Verse 19, by not counting men's sins against them. In other words, we are reconciled. God reconciles us to himself. He brings us back to that restored relationship that man had in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve sinned. He brings us back into that relationship by not counting our sins against us. That should get an amen. That's what the gospel is all about. He doesn't reconcile us to himself because we've been so good. Because we go to church every Sabbath and we smile and shake hands and hug. and No, he reconciles us to himself. And we start a new life. A new way of life, just like that perfect new year out there. No sins in it yet. Why? How can we stand before God with no sins in us? Perfect new creation. Because he doesn't count them against us. It doesn't mean we don't sin. We do sin. But when we do, God, forgive me. I hate this. I don't want to be this way. Forgive me. He smiles and says, I already have. And we'll see more about this as long as we maintain that attitude. Reconciliation doesn't mean that God changes. (laughs) He's not up there hating us and now all of a sudden He loves us. God doesn't change. God has always loved even His enemies. Reconciliation means that we are reconciled to Him. He said, be reconciled. That's a passive verb. That means that you don't do it. You just let God do it. He's already done it. He has already reconciled the world to Himself. Now all we need to do is accept the reconciliation by faith that God wants to give to us. Be reconciled to Him. Paul used the word reconcile to the church in Corinth because it was divided. It was it was a sad church. It was a divided church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, I appeal that all of you agree with one another so there'll be no divisions among you that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. There are quarrels among you. Is Christ divided? (laughs) What's the answer? And you are a new creation in Christ. Why are you fussing among each other? Why is there distance between you and a brother or a sister? There are quarrels among you. Jesus even prayed in John 17, 21, that they may, that we may all be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Reconciliation is necessary to make us one, to restore a broken relationship that we have with God. We're born with it. That's why we have to be born again. Anew in Him. But before any human relationships can be restored, we first have to be reconciled to God. We implore you, Paul said, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Accept what He has already done. So, in verse 16, He lays it on us, folks. And we need to understand what He's saying. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. There is not one brother or sister, no matter how mean they might seem to you, you have no right to judge them from a worldly point of view. Because we are all reconciled to God. And we can't decide who is and who isn't accepting that reconciliation. Because the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. 
the Bible says. Not us. I can't convict of sin. I can't reconcile. I can only declare to you what God has done. And plead with you to accept it. Paul focused on this like a laser beam in, in Romans chapter 6 verse 1. And following. What shall we do that then? He said. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Now why did he even ask that question? The reason he even asked the question is because there were people in the church that were teaching that we can go on. If Paul, if what you say is true, that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works, but by grace, then the more we sin, then the more grace we can get. That's, that's how the worldly mind thinks. But Paul answered, verse 2, by no means. Why not, Paul? Because we died to sin. You can't go on sinning. You died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in His death? What do you mean? We died to sin. Can't live. What do you mean, Paul? We died to sin. You were baptized. You can't go on sinning anymore. You were baptized, Mark. You were baptized, Ray. You were baptized, church. You can't go on sinning anymore. Why? Because you were baptized. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You were baptized. You were born separated from God. You were born outside of God. You were headed to destruction, but you encountered Christ and he you were baptized and you died to that old life. You buried it in the water. You came out of the water and you rose to live a new life that will honor and glorify God. You can't go on sinning. But if you do, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ. In chapter 6, verse 11, he goes on to say, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Count yourself dead to sin, alive to God. By baptism in the Christ's death and resurrection, we are in Christ and we are a new creation and God has rulership for us. Christ is our Lord. He is our master. Now we must live in that new creation Paul comes to this forceful conclusion in verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. You were baptized. You're, born. You're a new creation now. You have a new master. Therefore, don't let sin. Why not? Because you are a new creation. Don't let sin reign. Christ is Lord now. Notice how he moves from... The scholars call it indicative and imperative. And I know that sounds awfully technical, but I tried to think of an easier way to describe it. Indicative means a statement of a fact. The fact, you are a new creation. That's a fact. No one can dispute that that believes in the Word of God. You are a new creation. Therefore, out of that fact comes an imperative, therefore... Don't let sin reign in your hearts. He didn't say, don't let sin reign in your hearts and then you become a new creation. No, you are a new creation. I did it. I did it for you. You are. Therefore, don't let. But why, if I'm a new creation, do I have to fight sin in my body? I'm new. Why do I have to fight sin? Romans 8, 14, I like this illustration. He said, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. They are sons of God. Notice, that's the, that's the indicative, that's a fact. They are sons of God if they're led by the Spirit. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. 
Romans 8.23. Now notice the fact, indicative fact, we are children of God. Are you a child of God? Say it. We are. That's a fact. Indisputable. If you have asked Jesus to take reign in your heart, you are this, a child of God. But in verse 23, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, meaning there's more to come. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. What? You are the Son of God. Oh, I'm groaning. I'm, oh, I'm just, I'm just waiting to become a Son of God adopted by God. That doesn't make sense, does it? Well, maybe a couple decides that they want to adopt a baby. That's a good illustration. Same thing he talks about there. Ta adopt a baby. So they pay the prices. The checks are written. The pay the fees. They do all the interviews. They do everything you have to do to adopt a baby. Is that baby theirs yet? I mean, they sign the papers. You are the parents. Are they the parents? Come on now. They signed the papers. They paid the price. Is that baby theirs? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, somebody. Yes. But he's over in Romania, Africa, somewhere. It's not till they go over there and pick that baby up. And fly him home. Put him in his own bed. Now. He's ours. You are a child of God. But you're living in a world of sin. There's an enemy out there. Trying to make you think you're not a child of God at all. And we have to fight that battle until finally Jesus comes in the clouds of glory and eradicates every trace of sin. And we are in Him, a new creation, pure and true, just like Jesus made us to be. We struggle with sin as long as God forgives us and He forgives us as long as we're repentant. I'm driving down the street and somebody pulls out in front of me in my brand new car and man, I have to slam on the brakes and whirl over and almost hit another car and I'm... Poof. And Dina says, I get uncomfortable when your knuckles turn white on the steering wheel. I'm not angry! <laughs> and then after I get good counsel from my wife, I say, God, that's not acting like a new creation. Forgive me. And he says, I already have. As long as we maintain that connection with Jesus. But if we ever say, well, he was a jerk, God. He deserved it. He needs to go crash off somewhere. Then I'm relinquishing. I'm relinquishing the reconciliation that Jesus gave me. So what do we do? We stay. We stay with Him. We stick with Him. So how do we how do we remain a new creation in Jesus? I jotted down you know, I'm having to skip a lot of stuff and because I didn't know how long this was going to take. So the best stuff I'm leaving out. So next time, you need to come. If you want to get the rest of it, don't miss. But I can't quit without telling you how to offer ourselves a living sacrifice with Jesus. It's so simple. First of all, prayer. Uh, first of all, Bible study. Digging into God's Word. Not just to memorize Scripture so I can memorize Scripture. No. But to know God. 
to understand God and to let God live his love out through me. That's the kind of Bible study I'm talking about. There's a place for proving our doctrines and understanding what the Bible teaches about the state of the dead and the Sabbath. There's a place for that. We have to know that. But first, we better know God. And then pray. Submit your heart to God. Pray earnestly. I do. I pray this every day. God, search my heart. I don't even know what's in there. If there's anything in there that shouldn't be, please, God, help me. Take it away. And you know what? You think the older you get, the fewer things you find. But it's just the opposite. The more frail, the more needy, the more help you need. Search my heart. And then God against wrong thinking. Don't let one word come into your brain. The mind fixed on the spirit will do the things of the spirit. God is more interested in what you think than what you do. And in my next sermon, I'll prove that. I had to skip over that. He's more interested in what you think and how you think than what you do. Because he knows that a good man does good from the good stored up in his heart. And he knows your heart. And he knows that if you think and fix your mind on the things of the Spirit, you will wind up doing the things of the Spirit. And so guard your mind. Think about what you're putting into your brain when you turn the TV set on. When you read a magazine or a novel or whatever, think about what you are fixing your mind on because that's what you're telling your body to do. Guard against wrong thinking. Seek ways to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal that new creation in you. Whenever you meet somebody, and it goes with number five, share your faith. What can I show this person about God that will let him know that I'm a new creation? That I don't judge people by the world's outward appearance. I want to look at the heart. I want to know who you really are. The outward appearance, the outward behavior will take care of itself as long as we're fixing our minds on the Word and on Jesus. Paul said, Romans 12, 2, don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is and his good and pleasing and perfect will. That's what we should be thinking like all the time. Paul lived what he preached. He spoke from the conviction of a personal encounter with his risen Lord. Three times in the book of Acts, he tells a story about how that encounter with Jesus affected his life and how it was a turning point for the persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus. It wasn't because he had studied all of the doctrines as important as that is. Please don't misunderstand me. We need to understand that because the doctrines define for us who Jesus is and what he was like and what he did. But Paul kept pointing back to his encounter with Jesus first. And how it and talks about how it affected his life. Only through that event did his did Saul of Tarsus heart change. And he accepted a new understanding of God and his plan of salvation. It was such a heart changing experience that it resulted in his permanent devotion to God that would stand the test of time and conquer every opposition and threat that he experienced. He spoke from an encounter with Jesus. Have you had an encounter with Jesus? It doesn't have to be like Saul of Tarsus. 
blinded by the light outside the Damascus Gate. You've all seen the pictures. It can, only, it can be simply from digging into God's word, asking God, who are you? And what do you want from me? Why do you want me? What can I do, God? It was such a heart-changing experience that it permanently affected his devotion to Jesus, a devotion that would stand the test of time until finally, standing at last before the Emperor Nero in Rome, Paul didn't waver for fear of his life, but he remained faithful to Jesus until his last breath. And that's the way we need to start our new year. We stand before God facing a new year as a new creation. In a sinful body, yes. Tainted, yes. But forgiven in Christ. A new creation. Because God doesn't see us the way the world does. He sees the heart. He sees us in Christ. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. As though God was making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God and to each other. And don't let this new unstained year go very far if you have a, recommend, a reconciliation that you need to make in your heart. Don't worry about the other person. Put the past behind you. Move ahead and show what it really means to have encountered Jesus Christ. as we ask him to live his life out in us. Now, before we sing, our closing song, I'd like to invite our head elder and pastor. Since we don't have one, he's shaking his head. And he knows what a burden it is to be a pastor. Maybe that's why it's so hard for us to find one, Dennis. It's my privilege and joy to celebrate the baptisms of Ray Wynn, if you'd come forward, please. And, and, um, and Mark Roshkolb, um, you can just stand in place if you want or just wherever you want is fine. Thank you both. We want to celebrate this with you. I have a certificate of baptism. And on here, it says, this baptism symbolizes confession of faith in Christ, adoption into the family of God, commission for service. Amen. And so, here's yours, Ray, and, whoop, thank you, and praise God for that. And Mark, here's your God bless you. baptismal card. Thank, thank you. you. Also, Dennis, Dennis let, let me say we're going to do word. it just a minute. You said I could. Oh, okay. <laughs> because this is significant, Tiffany is a member of the Sedona Church, and she just gave me a card this morning requesting transferring her membership here to our church. Praise God. Thank, thank you for doing it. Stay on. So we would like to ask our members, all of you who would really appreciate and like and would like to welcome Mark and Ray as members of the Cottonwood Seventh-day Adventist Church, please raise your hand if you would. Praise God. I think that's everybody. Isn't that good? <laughs> Any opposed? Thank you so much. Um, we'd like to yeah, give you a little token of our 
appreciation. What's in here, by the way? Um, okay. What's in here, by the way, is three things. Uh, maybe four, including the card. But what's in here is a loaf of bread. Because Jesus is what? The bread of life. Thank you, Ray. And also, there's a little wood plaque that says love on it. Because Jesus, what, Mark? God is love. And Jesus loves us. Amen. And a book of promises, promises from God that he will keep. And he promises that to us. So this is yours, Ray. So God bless you. And God bless you, brother. And God bless you, brother. We love you. Thank you for being part of our church family and part of the family of God. Thank you so much. Amen. Oh, we didn't do the hymn yet? Yes, you can. <laughs> well, what a good church member. He asked the pastor, can I go now? As an example for all of you. I think it's time now for our closing hymn, and uh, I already announced what it is and can't remember, but you do, so let's stand together and sing as Paula. Are you the leader? Abby. Oh, good. Not that it wasn't good for you, Paula. <laughs> Thank you. Jesus, King of kings, be thou my soul, the answer to all my questionings. Live out thy life within me, in all things have thy way. Thy blood transparent media, thy glory to display temple has been yielded and purified of sin let thy shekin of glory now shine forth from within and all the earth keeps silence the body has for thee Thy silent, gentle servant moved only as by thee. Its members every moment subject to thy call, ready to have thee use them or not be used at all. strain or stress or fret, or chafings at thy dealings, or thoughts of vain regret. What restful calm and quiet from bend and bias free, awaiting thy decision. When thou hast need of me, live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of kings, be thou the glorious answer to all my questions. Lord, you have loved us. You have died for us. You have reconciled us to yourself. And so now, Lord, we accept that gift of reconciliation. We accept the gift of faith 
that we wrap around you. And we go from this place pleading with you to live out your life in us as your new creation in Christ. As we begin a new year, may it be to your honor and to your glory. And Lord, we hope it may be the last that you'll come soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.